everybody! It is Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso, and I am very excited to show you what's new in R25. So I don't want to waste too much time here, but if you stick around until the very end of the video, I'm going to be doing a demo of our upcoming plugin, Utility Spline, so be sure to stick around until then. But we've got a lot to cover when it comes to what is new in Cinema 4D R25. I should note that like a lot of the recent versions, this is going to break all of your plugins. Rocket Lasso has already updated all of its plugins. So if you go to your download page, you should be able to download again. And it's the new version that will have R25 compatible versions. First of all, let's address the elephant in the room. And that is the new interface. Now, couple important things to note. First of all, don't freak out. I know a lot of people do not like interface changes, any interface change in any application, any app, any interface that you could possibly come across. It's always rough when there's a new one that comes out and people get used to them. You, your entire workflow is, move, is based on moving the mouse very quickly, going to what you expect. So let's keep that in mind. I understand that people don't like interface changes. And you know sometimes I don't as well. But this one I've been using for about a week and I'm getting used to it very quickly. In addition to that, if I jump back into S24, I'm actually tripping over where that layout is. So it doesn't take long to get used to it. We're going to step through some ways that you can convert it so it can be simplified back to what you remember if you really want to. Couple things to cover. First of all, this is the first major interface change in 15 years. So I think they would do a change if they wanted to make one and just make everything a little bit more modern and up to date. Second of all, these were not random changes. Everything had intention behind it of why things were moved around. As an example, all the objects aren't lined up here on the top bar anymore. Instead, they have been moved over near the object manager. So where do you create objects? Well, near where they're going to live. If I wanted a new cube, it lives near where it is going to eventually be placed. And that is next to the object manager and everything's lined up there. So just keeping that type of thing in mind, you'll see that things are more intuitive. Now, it's important at this point to distinguish between two different things. And that is the layout and the icons. The icons are updated, a little less contrasty and softer on the eyes, and they've been colorized and grouped up in more intuitive ways. So those are the icons, and those are what they are. We can't change that. But the layout, if you don't like the layout, you do have a way of reverting that back to the old one. And you can do that if you really don't like this new one and you want to get back to as traditional as possible, you can do that by going up to New Layouts, turning off this checkbox, and now we've got the old layouts. So I can click Standard, and now we've moved into the standard layout here. So if you want to maybe break this apart into two steps where you want to get used to the new icons while they're existing where they used to be, then you can click on this. And what's nice is this doesn't even revert to S24, but goes back to R25 when all these toolbars were aligned on the left. And I know some people didn't like them being aligned in the middle. So you can do this in two different steps. But once you're used to that and you want to go back to something, you know, the vanilla layout, we can turn on new layouts. And here are the new ones selecting that. We are now in the new interface. So let's look at a couple perks of it. The first useful thing to point out about this new interface is tabbed documents. Just like a web browser, we now have the ability to have all of our open documents tabbed up in the top. I've actually been finding this incredibly useful as I work. And you know what? It's a pretty unusual and unique thing that Cinema 4D does to be able to have more than one document open at a time. A lot of applications, if you open up a new document, it closes the old one. So if we jump around into these different ones. You'll just see that they're already open. It's really easy to jump to. And along these lines, we could be in this scene file, copy the elephant, and then jump into this one and put an elephant on Mars. And being able to copy and paste so quickly and move between the files casually improves everything across the board, just speeds things up a bit. Also, now we have the ability to click plus up there and create an additional document if we want to. We can click this X on any one of them and close them. Right-clicking on the Document tab, we can say Show an Explorer, which I find incredibly helpful. It's really a pain in the butt to go and track down your individual files depending on where you laid them out. So this is actually pretty helpful overall. Closing that. And then you can right-click on the tab, duplicate the project, and now you have two different copies of the same project open, which I also find incredibly helpful for maybe moving something into a new document, making some changes, copying it, closing it and then going back to the original file and being able to continue from there. The second thing to point out is these docked layouts. Now, once again, this is a very small thing, but I find myself using it a lot more often than having to go to some sort of dropdown to do it. I, I will casually change the interface. In this case, we've got this elephant. If I select it, I can jump into the sculpt mode and now we can sculpt on it. So I'll grab one of the sculpting tools and I can start painting on the elephant. And then if I want to add hair on top of this, we can, so let's go to groom. 
And under Groom, let's add a Simulate Add Hair. And now grabbing the brush tool, I could quickly paint on top of that. Now these are layouts that we had access to before, but the ability to jump to them so quickly is what is actually making them more powerful. So in my case, I've been doing a lot of nodes and we'll be talking about nodes a little bit later on. But I might click on nodes and very quickly, it's like, oh wait, I need to find something in the regular layout because I can just do a single click, get to it. I'll jump to this layout, find the thing I needed and then immediately jump back to nodes and continue from there. So that first order retrieval makes a really big difference, at least to me. Next up, we can create our own layouts. As an example, if you didn't want your bar centered here, you can always right click on your interface, say customize palettes. And you see, we got this nice big separator bar. If you double click any icon or this spacer, it will actually go away, closing that window. Now the interface is sort of locked there. Now clicking plus, you can say save layout as, and in this case, it's going to be opening in this folder. We'll just call this standard two, hit save, and it creates it, it puts it in alphabetical order, and now it's showing up in the interface. So I could always go back to regular standard, but if I want, I can go into my regular one. Of course, these are taking up a bunch of space up in this top bar, but they don't have to. Clicking that plus again, you see a list of all of the different layouts that are currently getting docked. So I could say, you know what? I'm not gonna be going to sculpting very often. I'm not going to be going to UV edit very often. I will not be going in the groom or paint terribly often. So turning those off, it will save space there. There's more room for these tabbed documents to go over and we just see the exact layouts that we want to. Let's delete the hair. And oh, one last thing in here, I won't be able to show it very well, but the old layout was sort of absolute. But now if I make any changes, if I were to drag this to a different monitor and change layouts, it remembers what monitor you're currently on. So it won't jump to your other screen. I think if you hold down control, it will jump to wherever you recorded it. By default, it's, oh, you're on this monitor. That's where you want to stay and it will create it there. So another little tidbit. The next interface feature to mention is the concept of hot corners. Now, you might notice a couple of elements are missing from the interface that you're used to. Specifically, the material manager is missing and the coordinate manager is missing. But those are things that when you need them, you need them, but you don't need them very often. So they were just eating up a lot of screen space. As an example, I'm gonna open up the vanilla interface of S24 and just take a look at the size of the viewport. Because of these, it's eating up a lot of space. If I tab between both vanilla layouts of the versions, look how much larger our viewport is overall. And that is, it's pretty handy and that extra space is definitely useful. Now, what are the actual hot corners? Well, the first one is the Assets Browser. So going to the top left, we click Assets Browser. Specifically, it'll tab out. It's eating up space where the viewport would be. Oh, and if you haven't checked it out, even in S24, they've been adding new content to the asset browser. So you can always select new content. And inside of there, there are new models being added. They added in some motion capture of a crowd cheering. I got to use those a bunch in my advertisement for Slicer, which was really fun. But anyway, here's the asset browser. It's already docked. It doesn't have too much space and it's really handy to open and close up in the upper left corner. In the upper right corner, that is where materials live now. And once again, the materials are living near where they're going to get applied. So they're not down here in the opposite corner. They are where they will get applied quickly. And it is now a vertical list. So we could always make that a little bit smaller if you want to see the names or not, change the size of it. But being able to see more of the names, I don't know about you, but very often the names would get clipped off very quickly. And now I think we'll be able to see them more easily here. And you know everything behaves the same. We can drag these directly onto the model that we want. Everything gets applied directly and we continue from there. While we're on the topic of materials, something to point out, if you right click, let's say we didn't have that open and you wanna to get to the materials quickly, not that you can't from there, it's very quick to click on, but right clicking, we can go down to make a new material by right clicking the object. So I've now made a new material and it's applied onto the model. Double clicking that will open up the interface for being able to modify that. So you can create new materials directly here without ever needing to go into the material manager. Right click and go to material and create a different type of material or go to existing materials and get a list of all the current materials and apply it directly from there so it can get applied directly as well. Next up is the coordinate manager in the bottom right corner. Selecting that, you'll see that we have our entire interface that we're used to. I can select the elephant base, move it. There is now a reset transform button right there to reset the PSR and then We've got all the different parameters. Now we can click on any of these arrows and have it increment up or down. But now every single one of these attributes, not just in the coordinate manager, but everywhere in cinema 
you can just click and drag the entire little interface as a slider. So I can drag that down. You'll see it jumps down. I can drag it to the right and it will jump up. And then something that's neat is if you select it, you can use the arrow keys and whatever number comes after the cursor, you can use the up arrow key and increment it up one or down and go down one. And then moving over, I can change it a little bit less and go over another one and change it a little bit less. So being able to move the arrow keys around and get direct control over that is pretty useful as well. Let's hide that one and move over to the last one in the bottom left corner is the timeline. Clicking on that, it's going to open up a timeline or dope sheet for you to be able to manipulate your keyframes very easily right there in this default interface. As much as everybody loves the elephant, let's jump into a different scene file for a change of scenery. This scene file is using my plugin Mesh the Spline to convert this car into splines, but we're not here to talk about this. We're here to talk about R25. Moving on, we're going to be talking about the changes to the way some of the icons behave. Let's go back to the standard layout and take a look at the order a little bit more. As mentioned, objects were moved over here to the right and on the top, so it's kind of like this would be the first things you imagine. These are the more global settings that apply to everything. So things like the coordinates, are you going to lock X, Y, or Z? If you're going to set it to world coordinates and then what mode are you currently in? That's kind of applying to everything and that's why it's up on the top. Now on the left menu, what we have is something that's been updated and that is context sensitive menus, meaning this is going to update depending on what tool you're currently on. By default, we are in model mode, but there are other modes like the texture mode or polygon mode, edge mode, point mode. But you'll see if you look on the left bar here, the context of those is changing depending on what we might be doing. So in this case, if I select point mode, you can see that we've got some different spline tools. So I could grab the sketch spline tool and just start drawing on the screen and creating a spline immediately or getting rid of that. We can click on the next tool, which is just the polygon pen tool. We can start drawing out some new polygons just by holding on control. I can drag them out and just make different polygon layouts from that. So it's giving us a context for exactly the tool that we're in. So now that there's actually a polygon object going, you see additional tools have appeared. Now, if you don't recognize the icons, you can always look in this bottom left as you mouse over any tool. In this case, here is create new points. There is closed polygon holes. Here we have bevel and you can see the little fly out, which would also essentially the equivalent of bevel for splines being chamfer and round and bridge. Here's extrude the tools you'd expect to find in the bar, depending on what tool that we're in. Again, let's clean this up, delete that. In addition to that, though, we are able to make our own dynamic palettes. Let's open up a new scene file and right clicking kind of on any interface icon. You can open the customize palettes that will open up the command manager. And from there, I can say I want a new palette. So with this new palette open, we are able to go into different modes and modify this. Now, by default, we are in object mode. I'll turn off edit palettes. I would like to go into polygon mode to start out with and then go to edit palettes. So what are some things I use pretty commonly here? Well, keep it simple. I'll search for an extrude. Love me some extrudes. And we'll search for inset, which is which used to be the inner extrude, but that's inset. And OK, those are the two tools to use when I'm in polygon mode. So we got two icons there. If we were to right click on one of them, you'll see we have a new flyout called dynamic content. Currently it's turned off, but we can say, hey, I want this to update. This palette should update depending on what mode we're in. In this case, let's do document mode. So selecting document mode, that is now saying like, oh, okay, I was in polygon mode. So when I'm in polygon mode, this is what I should show. So then let's temporarily turn off edit palettes, go back to edge mode and then start editing again. Now we're in edge mode. So we can say, okay, now that we're in edge mode, uh, these aren't terribly useful in edge mode. So let's get rid of those, double click and those will erase out. And let's add in something that might be useful in edge mode. So I'll search for edge and I love the edge cut. So I'll just drag that in. We'll just keep it simple on that one. Turn this off and go to point mode. And while in point mode, we don't need the edge, but I would like to use, I don't know what's something good in edge. Let's search for iron. I like the iron tool as well. So having done that, we can stop editing the palettes and now we've got our own little docked icon palette, right clicking on it. Let's say that this should be vertical. So I'll say change orientation. And now I'll drag this wherever I want to place it. So let's just scoot it right there above those. I'm gonna pull everything out, but I'll scoot that back. Oh, looks like the orientation changed again. So I'll say change orientation and scoot everything in. So it's nice and compact. Closing that out. Now we've got our 
ironing tool there. But if I go to edge mode, you'll see we've got our edge cutting. And if I go to polygon mode, you'll see that I have my extrude and inset turned on. So we've now made a custom context sensitive palette. While we're in the world of talking about customizing palettes, I would like to go into the asset browser and search for our friend, the elephant. Now right clicking anywhere, we can again customize palettes and now drag the elephant or any asset from the asset browser and we can place that anywhere we want in the interface and now we've got an elephant button to automatically load that into the scene. Double clicking it though, let's do something a little bit more dynamic. Turning off edit palettes, I would like to click on the cube, hold down and click on this tear off and that will tear out a palette for us. And now let's begin to edit the palette again. Let's say I want to add the elephant in as if the elephant is a primitive object that I can drag it in whenever I want to. So dragging in the elephant, that will add it here as one in the list. Now right-clicking on the cube, I can say fold palette and that will collapse the entire thing down into a single icon. Double-clicking where the cube used to be, it'll kill that one off and now I can drag this one where that one was. Turn off the command manager and now I've got a new cube fly out and there is the elephant inside of that list ready to be grabbed and added into the scene instantly from there without even needing to go into the asset browser. Now there's certainly a lot to learn and get used to when it comes to the interface. I certainly don't have it all memorized and I'm sure if you're watching me during a live stream I'm going to be tripping over a couple of the buttons until I get used to the way they look and where they've been placed and even some of the new features about them. For instance we've got up on the top some the ability to turn on the snapping. We've got, ooh, this one's cool. If I click on this, we can see the different snap settings, which we've always had, and quantize, which we've always had. But then there's also the mesh checking. And while we've had this, it was kind of hidden away. So to show you, if I twirl down the elephant, grab the elephant body, click on that, we can click on mesh checking, enable it, and that's now going to be giving us a bunch of interactive feedback about different bits of the elephant. For instance, you can see that there's a hole where the eye goes, and this says, oh, outline boundary edges in green, and it's now showing that. And then this is a complex pole, anything that's this purple color. And you see right there, that means that there are four points or more. And here's feedback that there are six of those. And there are 14 boundary edges. And there are 792 non-planar polygons. So just more information and very easy to get to with it being in this dropdown. So a lot to learn and get used to. But once again, everything is cleaner and more accessible right now, more than ever. I don't think it's going to be too important for anybody right now, but if you right click and open up the customized palettes, under file you have the ability to duplicate the current series of shortcuts and then modify them. So let's say you're coming from Blender, you could go and find all the common tools, set up the shortcuts for Blender and have that as a layout and then eventually be like, oh, I'm going to go back to the standard one and have multiple different essentially collections of shortcuts. So just want to throw that out there as well. A couple final thoughts to round this out. Something I'm sure everybody else has bumped into because I know I did it all the time. And that is going back to 24 or below. We have two different menus. We've got this drop down and this drop down. And I would mix those up all the time. No matter how much time went by, no matter how careful I was trying to be, I would always click on the wrong one. It's like, oh, I want to sweep. So I click on kind of like this nerves. It's like, oh, wait, it's not in here. It's actually in this one. Sometimes I'd even do like the USB thing where I'd be like, oh, it's here. Wait, no, it's not, not here. It's here. Oh, wait, no, I was right the first time. It's in this one. I would do that all the time. Anyway inside of 25 those have been merged into a single giant drop down and i think that's just going to simplify everything although we do have a lot of icons to get used to here so looking around i do feel like they are very well designed and they are intuitive it's just different so like my favorite connect object kind of is these two interlocking clamps and then if you go to your deformer fly out there's some really fun new icons inside of here i particularly like the jiggle and the melt icons are pretty cool and just because I don't know where else to put this for this 25 demo, if I were to select an object and change the display color to custom, we've got the color parameter, and we've had this color parameter on all over the place in cinema. But now if you open it up, it no longer has the OK or cancel button. It's sort of a live parameter, so I can just click and drag, and you'll see instantly it's updating in the viewport as we go. And you can click X or you can just click anywhere and that locks it in before you had to hit OK or cancel. And it's even funny because on a PC and a Mac, those buttons swap sides. So people would definitely trip over that when they switched versions. Now it just will disappear and automatically apply when you need it to. Another random tidbit is that Cinema 4D now supports HDRI monitors. And I think if you have a Mac one, it's called an EDR monitor. And the idea is you can actually see your HDRs, the brighter than white kind of show up in your monitor, but that wouldn't show up in a recording. And I don't have one of those monitors. 
The next thing I would like to go and tackle is actually not technically a new feature of R25, but it came out after S24 as one of the updates in Service Pack 1, and I don't think that this feature got enough attention, and it was highly requested. So I really wanted to make sure to emphasize it here, and that is Cappuccino and Dynamic Placement. Opening up a brand new scene file, I would like to load in a couple of models that I made. Now, if you're supporting me on Patreon, these models should be available as soon as this video goes live. There's a link down in the description. If you're not, you can just use some spears and cubes and it will work just as well. But the models I'm talking about are inside the Assets Browser. And if I clear out this search, I'm already there under Rocket Lasso Dice. These dice are what I'm talking about. Right-clicking and loading them in. They've now appeared. They're really tiny because they're real-world scale. So there they are, really small. Hitting NB, you can see that they're very clean and low-poly work well with dynamics, but yeah, they're just ready to rock there. Let's group them all up again and close the asset browser. Okay, so we got some different dice. I wanna make a whole bunch of copies of this, so I'll select all of them and copy, paste, 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 paste. Lots of different copies of that. Selecting all of them, I can select the dynamic placement tool, which came out in S24. And then just clicking and dragging, they're all going to explode outward and then try and go back to their original position, which is really great. None of these should be overlapping anymore. So now we got a giant pile of dice. And now I would like to drop these down something. So let's hit, let's actually just drag them up into the air and we want something to fall down. So making a landscape object, we got a big old giant landscape, T for scale, shrink that down a bit, make it way taller. There we go, something for that to fall down. Now selecting just the dice, I can go back to our dynamic placement tool. If we turn on visualize colliders, we're going to see a preview of what this looks like and it's pretty good. That's actually a pretty good low poly version of where those might fall. If you want to make it a little bit more accurate, you can turn on accuracy and let's jump it to, let's say eight and eight. And everything's going to recalculate as it makes a low poly version of this so that it can run nice and quickly. Yeah, you'll see that there's a little bit more detail. It's a little bit more accurate on there. So now holding down shift while in dynamic placement, it will trigger gravity and they'll all fall down, bouncing around and eventually settle wherever the settings allow them to. And usually this tool is made just for dynamically placing these things. That's why it's the dynamic placement tool. But a very, very common request. I saw this over and over again during live streams and during my S24 video is people wanted to be able to record that and have control. So, and if you're not familiar, you could always grab this and drag it around. You see this is dynamically being dragged around. We can place this however we like. We could change the scale and move them around. Let's say you wanted to be recording that somehow. Well, now you can. And as I mentioned, this came out in the Service Pack 1 of S24. But let me show you. If we click on Cappuccino now and click on Start Record, now as I hold down Shift and drop all of these, you're going to see that every single one of them is getting keyframed. So now close that down, rewind, and now all of that motion has been captured. Let me deselect them. You can see that that animation has been captured and you can try it again and again. And instead of putting a bunch of dynamics tags and setting all the settings up, we can just uniformly capture that, record it, and now that's ready to be sent out to some sort of animation. And that would go along with any motion that you do. I just thought that that was such a nice addition that I needed to bring it up even in this R25 video. The reason I brought that up is it's really important to remember that Maxon is releasing two full versions of cinema every year. So we're kind of getting more features than we ever did over one year's release cycle. In addition to that, something like Service Pack 1 came out and they added in the ability to capture all the different dynamics through Cappuccino when you're running your dynamic placement, which is pretty cool. And then, as I mentioned, in the Asset Browser, they're adding new assets in as the year goes by. So there's a lot of additional content coming out inside of Cinema 4D, and I think a lot of that was able to be unlocked because of them going subscription. What is next? Well, this is a pretty important feature that they've added in. It's very simple, but it's very intuitive, and I think it's going to really add to a lot of people's workflow, and that is presets. Opening up a brand new file, we can start out really simple, creating a text object from this flyout. We've got the text object and a text spline, but I want regular geometry. This probably happens all the time. You probably use text pretty often and you have to change a bunch of settings by default because this is just not the way you use text. So let's say we've got a bunch of things we want to change. Changing the depth to 50 and perhaps not quite so many subdivisions. I'll set that to 15 and change the height to 100. Maybe I want it centered in the middle. Change the font to, I don't know, let's say Rockwell. Let's even say it says Rockwell. Now, 
you, in the past, you could have overridden the entire object and had it load in a new default. But now I can click this drop down in the upper right corner and say save preset. And I would like to save it as Rockwell. Hit save. Okay, cool. That's now saved. Now let's change this over to, oh, I don't know. Let's go to a different font, something weird. Let's do MS Gothic. And we'll just say Gothic here. And let's make it flat. So we'll flatten that out. And okay, that's a different preset that we might want to use. We'll jump this back up to 200 as well. So click the drop down, say save preset, and say Gothic flat. Save that. Now, deleting this object, opening a new scene file, closing cinema, reopening, it doesn't matter. If we go back into the text object, we can click on this drop down, and we can now see we can change this to Rockwell. We can change this to our Gothic flat. And we can now create as many presets as we want, create all these different modes. And what's really cool is that this applies to any object in cinema that has parameters. So you can do this inside of, let's go into the material manager, double click, make a new material. So if I double click here and open up the material manager, actually we'll leave it here in the normal docked one. We can change this. Let's say that we want the default to be no color, but just a pure white luminant. So click on this drop down and just save this as loom save that and now when i open up a new material it can be the basic one but i can instantly click this drop down and go to loom and update it to that preset incredibly useful incredibly powerful but it doesn't stop there deleting that why don't we make a matrix object so the matrix by default has a bunch of cool different presets but let's say that you've got very specific things you want it to do like a grid here is very useful but Maybe you want a vertical grid by default. So let's set this to one by 100 by one. So that's a different default. So let's save that as vertical, but actually we could save this as vertical, but I would like to right click on the count and say, save selected as preset. And let's say 100 tall and save that as a preset. And a different one I want is maybe a simple five by five by five. And perhaps at that point, we want to also change the size. So let's put exactly 20 between each one of those. Selecting count and holding down control or command, I can select the size as well. Right click and say, I would like to save as a preset. And I'll just call this 5x, 5x, 5x. And hit OK. And now we've got those particular parameters recorded. So now when I click on this drop down, I can say, you know what? I want this to be 100 tall. But you see that the spacing didn't update because when I saved as a preset, I only saved a particular setting. But then let's modify this just so we can definitely see the change. Let's click and say, I want my five by five. As soon as I do that, I had overridden count and size and that's what overrides it. So you can make these big absolute overriding presets and you can also make simplified ones that are only applying to particular parameters. Creating another text object, Clicking instead of the drop down, clicking the word default, it's actually going to pop open a simplified version of the asset browser and you get a visual preview of all of your presets. But there's something pretty cool here. If I mouse over any one of them, you see there's a little crown icon. If you select the crown, you've kind of promoted that up. And what that means is when we get rid of that, make a brand new text object, it will default to that setting. So at any given point, you say, you know what? This is the new master one. That's the one I want to load by default. You can click the crown and that one now becomes what loads instantly. But of course you click this drop down and go back to the regular old default and go back to that. So now it's non-destructive and you can make as many versions of this as you want. And as I mentioned, it can be applied to materials. It can be applied to any objects, anything with parameters. I even had tested it by going into a material and I had applied Let's go into luminance and inside of here, go into a noise inside of the noise. Look, you can do it inside of here. We can change the default settings inside of the noise and make presets for that. So your ability to customize your own personal cinema and have common objects you need, man, this really opens up a lot. If you want to be even more organized with your presets, you can go into the assets browser, click on presets, and inside of there is going to be a giant list of all of the different presets that you've put together. So there's our five by five by five. And there's a noise one that I had made and just all sorts of different subdivisions. But here's the text. You could select any one of these and right click and say show details. And now we've got, we could put keywords in here and make it searchable. We could add dependencies to it. You could create a brand new image of it. 
let's say actually let me see if I can do this properly if we just zoom up on the text actually I guess I should load this in and if I double click it'll create that default so if I were to zoom in on this and let's send that to the picture viewer it's over here I could say hey copy and then on this image right click and update from clipboard and now that is the preview image so it's that quick to change exactly what the icon should show up as and that has now been updated that can be the default and we see all of them all previewed here there's a bunch of spline presets I made for myself all the defaults that cinema comes with so a lot of power there to organize more create presets and just speed up your workflow close that down and tackle the next feature and that is spline import now spline import is kind of a fancier integration of the old art smart plugin from cineversity so opening up a brand new file actually dragging over illustrator you can see i've got an illustrator file here and i don't use too much illustrator so i asked my friends over at loose keys who are a local chicago studio who create animations and explainer videos i'm gonna have a link to them below they do good work so this is an Illustrator file that they gave me. So moving back into Cinema, dragging over that Illustrator file. Keep in mind that is an Adobe 2020 Illustrator file, so not like an old Adobe 8. Selecting OK, change any settings you want, but hitting OK. This will now import that file, and boom, there it is, created. We've now got a whole bunch of geometry created. Anything that was a fill is created as an extrude. Any of the different lines that you created are now brought in as sweeps. It is live linked to it. So selecting this object, which encapsulates all of this, you can open it up in Illustrator. You can click this refresh button and have it refresh from any changes you made in the master file. We have different settings we can change here as far as the separation. Let's change this to maybe a 0.2. And now there's not that much separation between the layers anymore. I'll put it back to 0.5. We can, you see, we got a bunch of different settings here. We can change this to have a little bit fewer polygon counts traveling around. You can make this editable and you'll see all of your individual objects exploded inside of it. So all imported separately, but I want to keep that. Actually, I guess if you want to do that, it'd be good to make a duplicate and turn it off and then make this one editable. So you can always go back to the original if need be. Additional details that are important are you can also import PDFs and SVGs as well. And just have some fun with this one before we move on. There are, of course, a bunch of other settings. Things like the width, the depth, the growth, which I can drag this back and any path from Illustrator will only draw, in this case, 20% of what there was. You can always right click on one of these parameters and it's going to jump that back up to its default. If you do a partial growth, you have an offset so you could animate a line around. This scene file is not set up very well to do that. But now that this is all geometry, let's have a little bit of fun with it and create a floor object. So there's a floor and scoot that down below and then just throw on both of these a simulation and we'll say a rigid body setting. What's cool is if we select the rigid body on the Illustrator import, we can go to collision. You can see that it is already applying the tag to children and setting it to individual elements. So that means I can just hit play having turned those settings on and the entire thing falls apart, collapses and it's fully dynamic that quickly. So a lot of fun to be had creating and importing different files from Illustrator and bringing them into Cinema 4D. Important to note, I didn't have a file that showed it, but this also supports symbols, color spaces, and gradient fills. Next up is the track modifier. Now for this, we're going to need some animated keyframes. I wanted to get some motion capture, but maybe not the stuff that Cinema provides. I wanted to find something maybe a little bit weirder, a little bit more jittery. So I went to looking around on the internet and I found this website called mocap data and they had one category called joke which I think were outtakes and in that collection I found this file so there's a bvh file I'm importing and from there you can see I've got a character if I hit play it's going to animate it starts out in the t-pose and then it just starts doing some silly movements but you can see that it's decently jittery and that's kind of what I was looking for in this test so in order to show the differences, I would like to make two copies of this. Expanding this will make a duplicate of it. Selecting the hips with the middle mouse button, I can select it and all the children automatically. Going to the basic tab, I'll change the color to, let's go with this dark purpley pink, just so we can see the difference between the default one and then this one that we are going to modify. Selecting hips, I will right click and add the new animation track modifier. Now, what is a track? Well, in Cinema 4D, 
you are recording keyframes and keyframes are stored on a track. So a track is the line that holds all of those keyframes and this is going to modify that. Now I have found a couple of limitations in this tag. I haven't gotten to play around with it too much. So we're going to focus mostly on the spring mode and maybe tinker a little bit on some of the other ones if they're going to cooperate. So to begin with, we've got this default setup. I would like to turn on affect the entire hierarchy so it's not just a top object. For some reason, the strength is down at zero by default. So I'll set that up to 100 so we can definitely see it. The green one is got the track modifier applied. So you definitely see two different motions happening and the green one has all the springy wiggliness on top of it. So definitely having a big effect on the entire hierarchy. So how might this be useful? Well, it's non-destructive. The original keyframes are there and unmodified. So we are able to make changes here by doing things like adding a bunch of stiffness. So now it's trying to snap into those positions more quickly, but it's going to get rid of some of that jitter. And then even better, I can do something like add a lot of drag on top. So let's go easy on the stiffness. And with a lot of drag, you see that these are very slowly going to attempt to obtain the position. So with a nice combination of stiffness and drag, we can slow down the overall motion and it'll eventually get where it needs to go, but takes out that jitter. So it's very similar to spring when you use like the spring constraint tag or spring inside of fields. And I think that there is a lot of usefulness to be found here. I'm pretty sure, yeah, we can go above 100%. So of course we're gonna get some super crazy motion there. Right click the arrow to reset it to default, which is actually zero. So I'll say 100 and we're back to it wiggling around. So yeah, as much stiffness and as much drag as you want. Lots of drag means it follows, it drains the energy out very quickly. Now let's go and actually delete that tag and then start again on it. And on uh, this iteration, I would like to once again set to hierarchy and then jump into posterize. So po posterize is kind of like a quantize or a step effect. And by default, if we have play, it's not going to look terribly different. In fact, I think it's going to be identical. But if we begin changing the step frames, I'll jump that to five frames, you'll now see that that is only updating every fifth frame. So we can get some nice stop motion on top of it. Set that to any number that we like. Let's say that goes to 15. So only two per second. And you get this really cool kind of echoey animation happening on top of it. There are additional settings. I don't have a lot of intuition for them quite yet. Something like the offset, which will just, I think, rewind the time a bit. So it can happen, let me put this to zero or one. So you can see it's, it's actually just ahead in time by rewinding at 18 frames. Or you could say, okay, five frames later. So it's lagging five frames behind. And then there's time factor, which will slow it down or speed it up. I think I sped it up. So it's getting there quickly. And yeah, you see that's, uh, yeah, it, the entire animation is happening faster. So you can speed it up or slow it down via these. So I have to get used to the specifics of the way these parameters are interacting. But I think that this is very powerful. I have to say, I haven't gotten to play too much with the noise or the smooth. They weren't behaving ex the most intuitive way. So I'll probably cover those more in the future. It does seem like the noise is uniform throughout the entire thing. Let's see if we can get it to do a little something. Let me set that to zero, give it some strength. Let's go easy on the strength a bit. And you can see it gets pretty crazy and twirl that down and we have a lot of different settings where it's affecting the position and the rotation. Let's just do a little bit of rotation and we are in hierarchy mode. And you can see that the entire thing is wiggling around with some noise, but I would like to see in the future, this have a different noise on every single object in the hierarchy because right now they're all identical. If I change the seed, they all change together, but that's adding on some random noise. And then going and switching this to smooth, it's very similar to what we can already get out of the spring with a lot of drag. But what this will do is as we increase the range, it's going to essentially blend frames that come before the current keyframe and frames that come after the current keyframe. And this remaps those values. And hitting play, we can get a little bit of smoothing in between those. You see, it just takes the edge off of those just a little bit. So a way of smoothing between those. Capsules. Capsules are a new integration of scene nodes directly into the object manager. So let's start out nice and simple. Opening up a new file, I'll create a plane and we need the asset browser, which I will set into nodes, change this to a list view, shrink it all the way down so we can see an entire list of them. And now what we can do is start dragging in certain nodes directly into the object manager as a modifier. So the instant I drag this extrude over, let me hit NB, you can now see that that's extruded this plane upward. Rotating my camera down, you can see that every individual polygon has been extruded. 
we can go into the settings, extrude these up, do an offset variation, see different offsets. So what we have here is a parametric version of an extrude. Let me hide this safe frame so we don't have that distracting us. So what do we got here? Well, it is a way that we can start using individual nodes or even collections of nodes directly in the object manager. So this is the beginning of really seeing production ready versions of these nodes in a way that I think anybody can start using them. So let's make something a little bit more complicated, not too crazy, but we'll keep it a little bit simple, step by step. Now, there's a couple of different types that we can use here. The main two ones when it comes to modeling are going to be your geometry selection and geometry modifiers. So under geometry selection, you saw that when we extruded, we extruded everything. But if I say I would like a noise selection, I can drag that into the plane and there is now a random selection happening. But we can't see that visually represented. So in order to make things clear, I am going to find a store selection and drag that next. The store selection is going to create a selection tag for us and I will just name it one. The instant I call it something, it will actually make a selection tag right there named one. With that in mind, we can create a new material, double click, change it to, I don't know, let's make a crazy pink color, why not? And then apply that onto the object, limit the selection to the selection tag, and now we can see where that noise selection is actually happening. So selecting the noise selection, we have the ability to change the seed to get completely different layouts, change the threshold to do less or do more of that threshold, and we could even change this from selecting polygons to points or edges, but we will stay in polygons. And we can even do all the different noise types, but we'll keep it simple. This is working well for us so far. So if that is the current selection, if we move into our geometry modifiers, I could drag in an extrude. And the extrude is extruding exactly those polygons from the active selection. Just like if you were to by hand select some polygons and then hit D for extrude and extrude outward, the current selection is what gets extruded. Now keep in mind, these are all individual extrusions. So if I want these to be extruded together, we can turn on Use Islands, which is very nice. And all of those are extruded together as a single piece of geometry. And you can see that our active selection is still here up on top. So pushing it further, let's grab an inset, drag that next. And you can see every individual polygon of the active selection shrinks. But again, let's use Islands and those all shrink in a bit. Then we extrude again. I'll make a duplicate of that same extrude and each of those levels extrudes upward. Now we can do additional things. Let's do something kind of fancy. I would like to go back to geometry selection and grab a new modulo selection. Dragging that in, it is now selecting every third polygon. But again, we cannot see that visually represented. So how about a new store selection? And I'll store that as two. Then on our material, I'll say I would like that to now show the twos. So now you can see every third polygon getting selected. Going back into that modulo, I can change this to every other. So now it's essentially gonna look like visual stripes going across because it's every other. But I could say, hey, every four polygons select two of them. And now we get skip two, select two, skip two, select two. And it just travels along that way. Let's keep it really simple though by going to, well actually three and one is pretty good. So let's do every third. So what I would like to do is another extrusion, but not from here. We could do it from here. Let me even do that. Let's create a new extrude. And from there, you see all of those individual polygons are being extruded, even the ones on the sides. And then they do a bunch of intersecting, which, you know, depending on what you're doing, might work, might not work. But let's delete that. And let's do one of the other new things we've got. And that is the geometry selection, select. Now, I'm very happy to see this in the past. It was kind of a pain to select everything, but we've got a bunch of options right now. I could say, type in the word all, and it will select all of them. Actually, why don't we immediately store a new selection so we can visually see this represented? So again, we'll do it from scratch, create a new store selection, and this one will store three. Selecting the material, drag in three, and now you can see all has been selected. We've got a couple of different things that we can select through this. Right now it's all, but we can do something like even. And now it's selecting the even polygons. We can select the odd polygons. We can select one comma two comma 11. And now it's selecting the first, the second and the 11th polygon. I can say, I would like to select 
mm, let's say 12 through 33. And now it's selecting 12 through 33. And I think we can even do 12 through 33, comma, and let's do 44 through 77. And now we've got two different selections. So we can type in anything we want, get a very direct selection. But where this is even more powerful is the ability of combining other selections. So we still have that early selection, which should be kind of the top of these plateaus. And then we've got our every other selection going on. So let's say I only want to see a selection where we have tag one, and you have to put in quotes, and tag two in quotes are. And now I'm saying I want to see where the two are combined. Only the every other one on top of the plateau is showing. Keep in mind, this is important. You have to think of this almost more like programming. So it's saying, where is there one and two? So this isn't combining one and two. It's where are one and two overlapping? Where are they both existing? You can also use the word or, and that is more like combining it, kind of like a Google search. Now it's the top and every other one. And you can also subtract from each other. But in this case, I would like to use and. And now we've got a nice complex selection in a very logical way that we can type out. And we can type in additional things. We can say and odd. And now you see only where it's also odd. But we can say or odd. And now we're getting the odd ones and the selections from the top with the plateau. All sorts of cool, crazy combinations there. It really opens up a lot of opportunities. But with that now being the active selection going on, we can go back to our geometry modifier, grab one last extrude, drop that in, and extrude a bunch of these. I will say use islands, just in case any of them are bumping up against each other. Put a bunch more offset. Let's do a lot of variation, add a couple of subdivisions, why not? And now we've got all these crazy stacks, this nice parametric setup. I could even do those other deformers like we did earlier, creating a smoothing drop that as the next object and now all that gets smoothed out let's reduce this only do a little bit of smoothing maybe even just one and get these nice little plateau type setups going keeping these as kind of parametric extrudes and parametric insets and we've got things like greeble and untriangulate and triangulate and solidify solidify is pretty cool let's after the smoothing add a solidify solidify is cool but i think we need to select all of these so let's again go to selection. I would like to select, let's drag in a new select right there. Type in all, I've selected all of them back into our modifier and we can solidify. And solidify is going to, oops, rearrange. Solidify is now going to essentially add thickness just like the cloth nerves would. So this entire thing actually has some thickness on top of it. We can go positive as thick as we want. We can go a little bit negative there and you'll see them all inflate but it's actually got some volume built into it. A lot of fun, super crazy combinations, and this is a big kind of deformer stack we've got going here. Let's create a cube instead, and on the cube, I'll set that to 22 by 22 by 22, and swap this entire stack from our plane onto our cube. And the instant that I do, you see, we've now got that cube getting all these crazy effects applied. The entire stack is still live, so I can go back to the original. Actually, let's turn off that solidify. We don't need that. And we can go back to the original noise selection and say, hey, a different seed. And that's going to filter all the way through, choosing different selections at that point. The important thing here is go step by step very carefully. If something doesn't seem to be working, turn everything off until it seems to be correct. And then start stepping through slowly, making sure that the different stacks are doing exactly what you want them to do. And as we step through, we can get all these crazy things all stacked up on top of each other. So yeah, basic capsules are very fun. Now, let's look into making one of those from scratch, opening up another new file. We will again keep this real simple, maybe making a spear, set this over to our triangles, and make something brand new. If I move into asset construction, we have a bunch of different types of nodes. We've got these different groups, and several of these are how we can create these capsules. Specifically here, there's a geometry modifier group dragging that in as a child the exact same way. It is a geometry modifier group, but it's empty. It's not doing anything. But because this is an empty one, I can double click on it and it's going to pop open the node editor. So why don't we switch over to the node view and double clicking it. It is now going to put us inside of that node. We are no longer in scene nodes. We are now in this geometry modifier group. And you'll see that it is inputting geometry, and that is whatever the parent is, and it's outputting geometry. 
So let's do the simplest possible thing. Let's pull in that extrude node again. I would like to pop open the asset browser. We are already in nodes. Put that into list view, shrink that way down. It's just the way I like to work. And keep it, keeping it simple, going into modifier, we can find that extrude, drag it in. The extrude wants geometry, so we'll feed it geometry. And it's going to output geometry. As soon as I drag that, you see that that gets extruded. We have now built our own modifier. It just happens to do a single extrude. Add in all the variation that we want. I wonder if that can go beyond. Yeah, it can go beyond. So I can even push that to go positive and negative by pushing beyond 100%. Right-clicking to put that back to default. This is something we're already doing. But keep in mind this interesting thing that just happened. And that is we dragged that extrude directly as a child. And it made one of these modifier nodes. But now we're dragging it inside of this node. And now it's just one small aspect of it. So let's make this even fancier. Let's not use that extrude this time. Let's delete that and maybe do a chamfer or bevel as it used to be called. Connecting those two, we'll see what the end result is. And right now it actually defaults to point mode. Not what I was actually intending to do, but that looks kind of cool. You can see it's taking every point and doing a small bevel or chamfer on the point. So with that modified this way, we can do additional things to it. So that just modified these. How about after it's chamfered, then we can do a inset and we can drag that directly on the line and that will interject it. And now you can see we've done a small inner extrude on every single one of those polygons. And then after that has happened, how about now we create an extrude? So that extrude happens after those. It actually didn't do that selection shrinking in. We should probably select all the polygons first. So going into our geometry selection, I shall say, after it chamfers, I would like to select all polygons. We're in polygons, I'll say all. And now it's selected all the polygons. And the instant I did that, it is now selected all of them. And then when it did the inset, that selection shrunk with it. And then we extruded. So that just creates the effect that I was looking for. The extrude, I'll set to, let's say, negative one. And that is now pushed in. We can even push it down, down, down. Just get whatever look we want. Maybe that's looking pretty good for me. And then let's make one last node. I'll search for, you can always double click as well. Search for a delete. And we can now create a delete node. That delete node, I will interject after the extrude into the final, deleting out those polygons. You can now see we are left with this outer, sort of this wireframe shell traveling around the outside. So that's looking pretty neat. And that is all ready to go. We can select all the nodes, hit L, and that will sort them together in a nice clean line. And maybe let's promote a parameter or two. We've got our inset, which is currently set to 20%. Here's what I like. I can click on this output and say connect node and then say mm, existing nodes, root, add new input. And that will automatically create a line from that particular setting out into the input. And then before we go and modify that, let's go into the extrude. And I would like to output this offset, selecting that. Connect node, existing, root, add new input. And now we have an inset and an offset. Now, going into our geometry modifier group, you'll see that those two promoted parameters have appeared here so now we have the ability to drag this slider and modify this generator in very simple, clean ways. We can have this extrude outward now. We have it extrude inward as far as we want to. You can modify these settings. I don't fully have my head wrapped around it entirely. You'll see right now that the slider is probably going to be insane. Yeah, it goes out really far. So the slider goes all the way to 1,000. Where based on what we're building, maybe the default slider I'd want to go to maybe 10. I don't know if we'll figure this out, but right-clicking on the word offset, I can say edit port, and we have the ability to limit the value. So I'll say I want to limit both, and it can go from negative 10 to positive 10. Close that, and we'll see if that works. Yes, save the database. And now you'll see if I grab the slider, it's going from, actually it only goes from, yeah, now it's clamped from negative 10 to positive 10. So I have the ability to lock those and make the controls a little bit more specific. So a lot of cool, crazy opportunities here. It's right now a good idea to keep things relatively simple. This is nice and clean, ready to go. We could group these together, but I think that's a good demo for making the basics of a capsule. Keep an eye out for additional content that I will hopefully be making in the future about this. And I'm pretty excited for the future of nodes integrating into traditional vanilla Cinema 4D. Let's move into another new file. And this time we will stay in the world of scene nodes proper. Now, here's my thought this time. 
Let's play with the new blue noise distribution, which is kind of like circle packing. And it's also how I put together that little still frame with all those spirals. So let's see if we can make that work. To begin with, I would like to search for an extrude. So let's search extrude and we should be able to find a nice basic extrude line. We need some sort of line. So let's search for text and that will give us a text spline. So text spline, feed the geometry into the extrude line that is getting translated through the spline tessellation that automatically created that for us. And we need to turn this into some sort of real object that we can feed out to the scene, which is always the geometry operation. So searching for geometry op, just keep that in mind. It's one you have to use all the time. Dragging in geometry, this now has very basic information as in like it exists at zero, zero, zero type of thing. That can now be fed out into the scene route and instantly you can see we've got some extruded text. So we can make some changes here for our baseline. In the extruded line, I'd like this to extrude an offset of zero. And let's type in some custom text here. We'll just say R25, center that in the middle. And we didn't really talk about it earlier, but keep in mind that a lot of the layouts have changed. So everything lines up a lot more cleanly. And I kind of like everything being popped out into these quick tabs, which is funny. I, that's why we've been designing all the Rocket Lasso plugins as well. So anyway, we've got a little bit of text here. We'll leave everything else default. Maybe we need a slightly fatter font. Let's do show card Gothic, which is not a go-to font of mine, but it was there. Let's use it. Spread these out a little bit more. Okay, circle packing. What do we got right now? Well, I like feeding this out so we can see that, yes, indeed, we've correctly built this. Let's say that that extruded bit of geometry, it shouldn't be an n -gon. So let's turn off n -gons and say maybe it's quads. Hitting NB, you can see that that is now returning as quads. Line these all up together, selecting them hitting L, nice and clean. Now, let's get some circle packing going. We can search for the word blue, and you'll see we got a couple different types. I would like a surface scaled blue noise. Dragging that in, it wants to be fed geometry. Well, that's nice because we've got some. So feed it some geometry, and it is like, okay, cool. I'm now outputting a distribution. Well, what is a distribution? In a lot of ways, think of that like a matrix object. It's a series of points and positions and saying, hey, this is where you belong. So having done that, what do we want to create on top of this? Well, keep it simple. I'll search for a sphere. And there's our little sphere primitive. It doesn't really exist as much yet. We need to set the radius when you're using this blue noise. Always set your radius to one. It's expecting exactly one as the unit of measurement. So that's outputting a sphere's geometry. Where should that go? Well, I would like to turn it into maybe some real geometry. So I'll steal that node and say, hey, you've got geometry and you can exist in the scene. And you'll see there's a tiny little sphere right there. And then I want to give it a position. So search for the word matrix. Matrix, I hope one day they change this because I don't think matrix is very intuitive to artist types. It's more of a programming thing. And the matrix is your position, scale, and rotation. So it's really your transform. So. That is saying like, okay, cool, you you have geometry now. And now we're saying, oh, and you also have a position. But the position can be like an iteration. It can be a whole list of positions. And that's what this is outputting, an entire list of positions. So feeding that distribution into the matrix will automatically get a link between distribution. And that's putting it into an iteration collection or iterate collection, which is now outputting the elements to the elements. But I'd like to break that connection and actually just say, I want the, not the entire list, but just the matrix to connect over. And the instant that I do, we've got a series of spheres sort of in the shape of that text. Hitting an A, so we can hide the polygons. You see, we've got an entire collection of spheres. Now let's change some settings. Inside of blue noise, you can see it's trying to output anything from a minimum size of five all the way up to 25. And it's trying up to 100 times. So let's get some higher resolution here. I'll say they can be as small as two and as large as 10. So you can see they, we start out a lot smaller and it's trying to make 100 of them, but let's make it so we can make a lot more and just click and drag the slider. And as I increase it more and more and more, you're gonna see that has more chances to try and fill this up. And now we get some nice circle packing going where none of these are bumping into each other and they're starting to fill that space up really well, creating a bunch of copies everywhere. So really fun start there. I'll give this a quick save into this tutorial folder. Just save it as 1A R25 blue. Okay, let's see if we can break this apart and do even more things with it. So zooming out a bit, we've got a bunch of different information coming from this. So we've got this distribution going 
and it is iterating through the collection. But that iteration is outputting a bunch of different information. It's outputting different indexes. So if it's outputting different indexes, maybe we can do something with that. So what if we want to apply some colors to this? Well, let's search for a color op. So search for the word color. You'll find a color op down here on the bottom. Drag that over. I would like to link it in as well. So now we're giving this chain of information color information. Up until now, it had no color. Replace that, and you see everything is turned black, and that's because the color op by default is just outputting black. So if it's just outputting black, well, it's pretty straightforward. doesn't do much, but let's try dragging in this index instead. So dragging in the index, we should see a single black one and the rest are white. Well, why would that be? Well, we are currently outputting a zero, and then everything else is one, two, three, and you can think of that as outputting 0%, and then 100%, 200%, but you can't go beyond white, so only one of them is black. But there's a different setting here instead of index, and that is ratio. And if we just drag this connection to ratio instead, we are going to slowly fade from the smallest number up to the largest number. We are also outputting color, but we've got so many different possibilities and so many different options here. But what I like to do is actually use the hash. Hash is kind of like a super range mapper. Searching for the word hash, we can drag this in. And what hash wants is, well, it's kind of like it's got two different random seeds. And I like leaving this one seed open for me to change the number. And then the salt is like the source number. So the source number I'll say is the index and that will feed into salt. So we're feeding in a whole bunch of different numbers and this is going to kind of randomize those numbers and output to us something between zero and one. So between zero and one is all good but it's got a couple of different outputs. It can also output color. So it's outputting anything from zero to one as an integer or a float or a vector or a bool to be on or off. But we can also just output a color. So this makes it really easy. Outputting the color into our color operation, we've now got 100% random colors going on, but we, that could be combined with anything that we like. Let's blend that using some different color options. I don't even know what they are. Let's search for the word color. And I'm guessing color blend will do something for us. So if we say that that is our foreground and then output this inside here, we can set a background color and let's make it, I don't know, let's go with a bright yellow green and start fading back on this. And yeah, now we can see those blending on top of each other. What, yeah, we've even, oh, okay, this was the correct node. I haven't even used this before. Let's say overlay. I love me some overlay. And yeah, we can start feeding in some of that color. You see it's dominated now by this green base that we fed in change this to multiply instead and now we can get some darker colors so you can see by combining in this case very few nodes we're able to create something relatively quickly very powerful and by using all this raw information pulling out the raw information from say this blue noise we're able to remap it and create all sorts of different functional things so it's going to get exciting as we continue into the future and are able to implement this into even more places in cinema Opening up a new file, let's spend a second talking about splines inside of nodes. Now, we had been using a bunch of the geometry modifiers and selection modifiers, but there are some other types that we can drag in. Currently, I can't get the spline primitive group working, but the mesh primitive group works to make spline, so let's do it that way. So, by creating a mesh primitive group, I can double click on it and go inside of it, and just like we were modifying geometry, we are now making geometry from scratch. You can see that there's no input, but there is an output. So in the most basic form, we could search for something simple like a primitive sphere inside of this and output that geometry. And now that is creating a sphere from scratch, essentially. Let's make something a little bit more interesting. Specifically, let's make a spline. Now, a basic thing we could do, and something that's neat, is if we go into the... I think geometry generator, nope, geometry primitive, there is a segment now. If we drag segment, it is a straight line spline that exists only as a node, but by outputting that into the geometry, we now get a straight line spline, something we've never had in cinema before. So creating a, let's hold that down while creating a sweep and then also feed it a rectangle, which is super huge, T for scale, scale down, 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 down. Now you can see we've got a straight line spline hitting N B. We can select these properties and create as many subdivisions as we like and make it as long as we like and even offset it left or right to make it pivot from the correct spot. So it's kind of a primitive we can make by dragging a single node in and now it can be swept or extruded or lofted, it's just used as a spline. So that's pretty fun out of the gate, but we can create our own as well from scratch. So deleting that segment, 
What if we want to build a spline completely from scratch? Well, let's start by creating a list of points. We can do that by creating an array, and an array is just a container of information. So I'll search for the word build, and inside of there, there is a build. Dragging that in, it is, hey, what is the data type? That's what it wants to know, data type, and the data type will be a vector. A vector is just three bits of information in a row. So yes, a regular vector is one, two, three. By default, it created four different points for us, which is just fine. So keeping the simple, why don't we just make a straight line here? I'll start out by saying negative two and positive two. Actually, let's make it pretty big. So let's say negative 100 and positive 100. Um, you know what, I'll keep it simple. Let's put a midpoint of zero. So I'm going from negative 100 to zero to 100. And I'm, I'll say truncate and get rid of that last point. So we have three points coming out from here. So it's three points, but what do we do with them? Well, we assemble them into a spline by searching for spline and grabbing a spline. Where is it? Spline assembler. So this array out of points can be fed to points, which can be fed out as geometry. And now I've got another straight line based on the numbers that I typed in here from scratch. We've now created essentially a spline primitive from the straight up numbers. Now, yeah, let's prove that. We've got X, Y, and Z here. Let's increase the midpoint up. And you see, as I drag this, the midpoint is going up or down. So look, we got an automatic little smile or frown, complete control over that. Currently, you see it's rounded, and that is from the spline assembler. By default, it's set to a Bezier spline, so it's automatically rounding it out. But that could be set to linear for direct connections between them. And also, we have a closed setting like a spline does. We can close the start and end, and those will just loop around. So a lot of power right there. And then if we want to make something fancier, we do have the option of using some of the distributions. I don't need this build anymore, but we'll keep the assembler. And let's go into the distribution menu. And we already used one of these from the blue noise, but there's a bunch of different types. You'll probably recognize most of these as different settings you would probably find inside a cloner or a matrix. Different layouts like spiral or linear or from a grid or from the edges of an object. But let's keep this simple and make a spiral. There's actually a primitive for this, but let's make a spiral. And I could show you how this could output a series of spheres or something, but just keep in mind this is outputting a series of points, but we need to be able to read this as positional information, and that's not what this is currently outputting. So in order to do that, we're gonna need a special node called a decompose node. So let's say decompose container. So I don't expect you to know that. I didn't know it. I spent a bunch of time until I figured this out properly. And this one seems to work. So if I put this distribution into the container in, it's now outputting a bunch of different information. And one of those bits of information is the matrix, which is all the positional information that we need. So let's output that matrix into our spline assembler. And the instant that I do, we're getting this, well, super crazy spiral happening. And that's because this is based now on the spiral settings here. And this is saying that every single point is rotating 137 degrees, which is a lot. So let's say like five degrees. And it's currently a closed spline, so let's say, no, you're not closed. And now we have a spiral going around, automatically being generated by this distribution, turning it into points, and then turning it into a spline. Currently, that has some height information, I think. Yeah, right here, here's the uh, diagonal. Let's flatten that out, so that should be laying flat on the ground. We could make that spiral more by adding additional degrees on there, and that will spiral more and more and more. And you can see how that is getting created really straightforward. Changing this to a different distribution type, let's do a radial instead. Swap that out. A radial is just a big old circle. And now you can see I've got a circle spinning around as many subdivisions as I like. Set that to any radius I want. If I want to close the gap right there, we'll just say close spline. So you can see how I can start creating spline primitives that could be output as different objects as well. Renaming this, taking different parameters and promoting them out into the main object, which we did earlier. Let's promote this one. Let's say the count goes out as an existing root, add new input, and we could do the radius, which will be the second most important, existing, sorry, root, add new input. So we got two settings going out, selecting our primitive group. Let's call this radial spline. And that we can now set to exactly the radius that we want to. Hitting the letter S, it even zooms up on it, and the count that's going to be fed into it. So creating these, modifying them, we could start feeding in so many things. We could spend the next five hours just building crazy node setups, doing things like dragging in noises to displace this and have them transform over time, or cloning spheres onto every single point, or blending between. 
there's, I'm never going to go into it, but we have the ability of weighting the colors on a spline. Essentially, there's weight maps on splines inside of nodes. So there's a lot of really powerful ways of playing with different bits of information, interlinking them using the nodes. And we have a very exciting feature in nodes inside of Cinema 4D. So that is concluding all of the new features that I have to show specifically about the new R25 stuff. You see there's a good mix of things all over the place. And again, this is a half year release. So keep in mind, we had all that stuff from 24 as well. Now, as promised earlier, I would like to talk a little bit about a preview of our upcoming plugin, Utility Splines. We've been very, very busy over here at Rocket Lasso the last couple of months. We released several plugins. The first one was Ricochet, which if you haven't seen, we can feed a model into our Ricochet spline plugin and we can make our spline bounce off of the model. And you can see here as I increase this number that we can bounce very fast, very quick calculations and let this bounce over and over and over again. Let me just type in an extra zero on there. You can see we can fill this model up to an insane number of bounces. It runs crazy fast with so many splines. There's a bunch of information about that, but you should totally check it out. And then we released our Mesh to Spline plugin, which enables you to take the mesh of a model and convert it to a spline interactively. So I've layered up a whole bunch of different splines here, but as I rotate around, this is an entire car model but selecting any one of our mesh to splines. You can see we can convert the edges or polygons or outline to it, converting it to a spline, which then enables you to render this out in third-party renderers very, very quickly. Hitting render here with Redshift, it's going to calculate all of the different lines and then render in the viewport and it renders a sketch and tune type look, but using Redshift or any other third-party renderer. And very recently, we released Slicer, the ability to take a model and throw it through Slicer, chopping it up into a bunch of splines or extruding it, creating bevels, lots of lines, and just opening up a lot of design possibilities there as well. So as I mentioned, we worked really hard on these. This is the way Rocket Lasso makes money by creating free tutorials and tons of free live streams, but we create plugins that artists can use to create cool work that they might not have been able to do otherwise. So unlocking your creativity is always our goal. And I'd appreciate if you take a look at any of these. It's the best way to support. And I've got links down below. But let's talk about the brand new one that's going to be coming out eh, maybe in about a month. I don't know exactly when. Opening up this scene file, I've got this vector file from vectorworldmap.com. And I like it because if we go to point mode and zoom way up, you can see how many points there are in this file. So zooming back out again, we can make this a lot easier to work with by going into back object mode, extensions, going into our rocket utility splines, and I'll start with a rocket smooth. Now by default, this will smooth things out, but I wanna simplify and don't even show that yet. Dropping the map into the smooth, I will zoom way up on one of the coastlines and turn on our tick marks. So I'd like to see how these are subdividing. Let's make that a little bit smaller and see how many points are being made up on this object. So we can begin to add iterations onto this to smooth it out. It's gonna look at the neighbors and by increasing this, it starts smoothing out the spline. So all those rough lines get curvy and round out, but there's still a lot of points that we started out with here. So we can change this to a different tool entirely, in which case let's pull this out from Rocket Smooth and instead feed in perhaps the resample or even reduction, but we'll start with a resample. If I feed in the map into the resample, you see immediately we've dropped down to very, very few points. Clicking on our resampling, you can see that currently set to source points step, and we got a bunch of different modes there. So we can say, hey, exactly every five units create a subdivision. So let's drop that down to one. You see a lot more points. If we crank this up to 10, there's gonna be a lot fewer points. So very quick to remap this to exactly whatever count you want there to be. Next up, we can change this tool to, instead of resample, we can go to our reduction. I do like reduction a lot. Creating that, I can drop the map inside of that. And this has, oops, it's got a lot of points, so let's override so we can actually see all of the points. And we've got several different modes here. We've got the deviation mode, which is the most powerful. And that is if the line wanders too far away, over one unit away, it is going to create an additional point. So this will only create as many points as are needed. Let's actually view those individual points from the tick marks. And if I say, okay, you can only deviate up to 0.1% from the original line. You can see that we get a lot of lines back in here again, but lots of detail. Going into the advanced tab, we can see 
that we have gone from 56,000 points and we reduced it to 26,000 points being at about 50% of the count. If I say, you know what, you're allowed to deviate up to 0.2, then it's going to get rid of a lot more of those. And now we've reduced it down to 26% of the original. But we have several different modes here. We have deviation, which is my go-to, which is why that's the default. But there's optimize, which behaves a lot like the Cinema 4D optimize for getting rid of points. So we can set that down to something small like 0.1, and it will begin reducing them here. It reduced it down to about 90% given that setting. Then there's percentage. We say, hey, get rid of a certain percentage of points. So let's say we get rid of 50% of all the points, and it's going to attempt to get rid of the least important points, keeping all the sharp angles that you want. And then lastly, you have angle threshold. So anything shallower than a particular angle will be removed. So you can actually control it that way. And these work great on top of fonts as well if you want to clean those up. And these all combine on top of each other. I could feed this reduced spline into the smoothing spline. Selecting the smoothing spline, we can now begin adding those iterations and see those points just smooth themselves out until we get a nice, clean, organic layout. Now that we have this nice, clean, organic layout, what if we want to reduce these points in a very clean way? Well, we've got another utility. And by the way, this tool will come out with all five of these as one. And the next tool is the Bezier spline. That is going to take any spline that you feed in and attempt to turn it into a Bezier spline. So let's check out what that is outputting. And you'll see that is reducing all of that complexity down to exactly these points. So if I were to make this editable, all that crazy complexity we had, going to point mode now, you can see it's reduced it all the way down to these nice Bezier lines. You get very clean control over. So everything just opens up possibilities for playing with splines. They have a lot of function. The reason I want to show these off is unlike the other tools we had, which were like really fun and kind of sexy to show off, these are utility splines. They give function, but they don't show off as well. So I just want to show off a little bit of that utility. There was also the cleanup spline, but that's more for very geometric shapes, which this one is not. And it just cleans them up really easily and gets rid of redundant points. But anyway, that's going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I look forward to seeing you in more live streams. If you're watching this video and it's brand new, Rick Barrett will be a guest on the live stream tomorrow. If not, I'll see you on the regular Wednesday live streams or in a future tutorial. Thank you so much for watching and for your support, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.